introductory remarks and it's, it's no loss to them. So I'm going to go ahead and get going here. Um, welcome to tonight's lecture, A Systems Approach to Soil and Water Conservation by Dr. Benjamin Turner of Texas A&M University, Kingsville. Um, what's neat about tonight's lecture is we're also doing it as a special webinar as a part of the Iowa Learning Farm. So as you can see, we've got some people online. And the online people, uh, when he's done with his lecture and you want to type in uh, some questions, feel free to do so. And obviously, we'll take questions from people in the room. Tonight's lecture is sponsored, oh, I should probably say, my name is Jacqueline Comito. I am the director of the Iowa Learning Farms. Um, tonight's lecture is sponsored by the Iowa State University Extension and Outreach, the Iowa Nutrient Research Center, the Iowa Learning Farms, the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture, the Iowa Department of Ag and Land Stewardship, the Departments of Agronomy, um, Agriculture and Biosystems Engineering, Natural Resource Ecology and Management and Sociology. So welcome everyone. Dr. Turner is a native of Texas. We met Dr. Turner, a group of us from Iowa State, went down and took his systems thinking, well their systems thinking workshop at Kings Ranch with Texas A&M. He received his Bachelor of Science in Agriculture from Sam Houston State University in 2009. He followed that with a Master's of Science in Agribusiness from Texas A&M, University of Kingsville in 2011. Between those semesters, uh, Ben interned with Texas Farm Credit in Robstown, Texas, Hunt Oil Company in Dallas, Texas, and, and I think this experience is probably really important, he day labored for several ranches in Cleburne and Lyon County. Ben received a PhD in Natural Resources Management at South Dakota State University, with an emphasis on systems analysis for agriculture. He was part of an interdisciplinary team and worked on a variety of projects investigating agricultural land transformation and resource decision making. Ben was able to work direct, directly with farmers and ranchers and he generated valuable information regarding producers' conservation priorities, historical and projected land use trends, and the long-term soil changes to land transformation. His work in South Dakota has been recognized by the National Cattlemen's Foundation, the Nature Conservancy, and the IC Systems Inc., which is a leader in systems education. After Ben completed his dissertation, um, he did work as a postdoctoral researcher at New Mexico State University. And here he had another unique experience where he was able to part do partnerships with traditionally managed irrigation communities, which has led to a number of key outcomes relating to hydrology and water resource management for agricultural systems in semi-arid regions. Now as a faculty member at Texas A&M um, University in Kingsville, Ben's research focuses on systems analysis of agro ecosystems, natural resource management, decision-making, and development of teaching and support tools for agricultural producers, students, and education, educators, and interested policymakers. Tonight's lecture is going to highlight his research that is grounded in the systems thinking aimed at a better understanding of the dynamics underpinning contemporary soil and water conservation challenges. Let's welcome Dr. Ben Turner to Iowa State University. Okay, um, is that microphone okay? 
higher and lower, a little higher. Let me see if there's a volume on there. Or is it over here? Let's see if there's volume on this. Check, check. Hello? Oh, here. Now talk. How's this? Better? I don't know if that's doing anything. Probably controlled over here. You just start going. In okay. Here. Well, Jackie, thank you for that uh, introduction. Let me make sure this guy is going to work and get my timer on. Uh, okay. See, this thing worked before technology. Uh, okay. So um, as the introduction said, I'll talk about some of the research that I've been a part of that is grounded in the systems approach to uh, resource conservation. Uh, before I get into that, though, really quickly, um, I'm not sure if anyone was around here um, about eight years ago to the night. Um, this is my first time personally in, at Iowa State University, but I have a couple of connections. Uh, to Iowa State University. So I've always felt a connection to this place, even though this is my first time here. Um, is this better? No. Is this better? No. 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 Okay. <laughs> so uh, if you were here or around or know uh, kind of what was happening at Iowa State University exactly eight years ago tonight, um, does anyone know what landmark happened on this campus at that time? Well, if you weren't, here, uh, I'll give you a. Oh, excellent. I understand this year that the, uh, the uh, Iowa State football team is doing pretty well this year. Did we beat Texas? Nope. Bigger. 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 So it was, as I was preparing for this, it was such a remarkable day that exactly eight years ago, uh, to this very night, uh, Iowa State <laughs> beat Oklahoma State, who was ranked number two in the country, number two in the BCS uh, at that time. And a couple of things that I'll never forget this night because I was a student, even though I didn't graduate from there, I was a student at Oklahoma State at that time. So I think I was the only person in Stillwater, maybe the only person in Oklahoma who was rooting for Iowa State that night. <laughs> And the reason for that is because the quarterback that night, Jared Barnett, is from Dallas, Texas, and is my cousin. Um, so, um, and he met his now wife here at Iowa State University. Um, they now live in the North Carolina area, I think. Um, but anyways, I, whenever I was starting to think about this, like exactly eight years ago, uh, that happened. And then there's another connection I have with Iowa State that I see every day at work. And so if you're associated with the uh, Leopold Center uh, here on campus, um, Aldo Leopold had a connection to South Texas. Um, I know you can't read this, but these are some copies of letters that Aldo Leopold wrote to a faculty member at Kitsman University of Kingsville because um, not even two years, less than two years before um, Leopold passed away, he attended uh, the wild, the, um, whatever the acronym, the wildlife National Wildlife Society meeting, which was in Texas that year, and made a point to go and visit Kingsville and King Ranch. And so he had a correspondence with a faculty member there in Kingsville um, about the wildlife conservation that was happening on King Ranch. And so um, often, when King Ranch is promoting the conservation, they'll quote these letters from Aldo Leopold because he was so impressed with the conservation efforts that the ranch um, was doing. So these hang in our ag building and I walk by them um, every day to teach. So those are a couple of connections I have to Iowa State and Aldo Leopold and, and things like that. So just some fun facts to get started. Now I'll get to the, the meat, uh, the good stuff. Uh, in my teaching, um, I start all my classes with a basic assumption. And, uh, and that sort of outlines what I expect from students um, in that particular class. Um, and so I came up with an assumption for tonight. The topic is a systems approach 
uh, to soil and water conservation. And my assumption is, is that if you were motivated to attend a talk like this, uh, then you probably have some of these characteristics. Maybe not all of them, but uh, maybe all of them, uh, hopefully some of them. So the assumption is that we believe everyone here cares about the condition of our soil and water resources, respects the ecosystem goods and services they provide, supports conserving and improving how they're managed, and desires that such principles and practices consistent with the above values are promoted by society and policy to better address the 21st century challenges we face. And I'll talk later uh, about some of the 21st century challenges that we face and how uh, this approach can fit in. So that's kind of my assumption and what draws me to the systems approach to soil and water conservation. Um, so the overview for my, my talk, and this is as much for me as it is for you, kind of a roadmap of where uh, I'll be going, um, is first some background rationale and foundations and systems. I'll then uh, move to some examples of systems analysis, some applications and cases um, that, uh, that Jackie cited in the introduction just a few moments ago, and then talk about some frontiers um, in the soil health movement and from the uh, decision making uh, frontiers as well, and then some reflections and acknowledgement on who all has been a part of this uh, work uh, over time. So, so, for the background and rationale, so here are some famous pictures of some events. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen these photographs from the Dust Bowl um, era. Uh, this one uh, in central South Dakota. Um, some of the samples that uh, are in some of our publications later happened about probably within eight or 10 miles of where that photograph was um, taken. Uh, and of course, this picture of the Lincoln Memorial in DC, uh, for those that um, have read about and know about the foundation of what was then the Soil Erosion Service, which now the, the NRCS as it's evolved. Um, Hugh Hammond Bennett and the leaders who were trying to get that started when they were testifying before Congress to get the appropriations to actually start the agency during that Dust Bowl era. Um, while they were testifying, they had to close the windows and doors to the Capitol because of the strength and the intensity of the dust storms that were hitting Washington, D.C. So that's some historical um, events. And, uh, and these things stick in our mind because of what they meant to society, uh, the impact that they had on culture and family, economy. Um, and so this was a really big deal. But the premise for tonight is that we're seeing um, some of these events, some similar to the Dust Bowl, others in different ways um, that are more recent um, that I think are just as alarming. And so here are some pictures uh, in central South Dakota. Um, flooding issues, here's some erosion and washout issues. Um, the color on this projector is not the best, I don't think, but if you can see this small creek here, uh, one side has very high turbidity, that's where the erosion and nutrient runoff from uh, newly cultivated fields is entering the stream, versus uh, the clearer side of the stream, which on that side of the stream, the runoff uh, comes from a uh, conservation, basically a grassland conservation operation. And so this is at a small swell of creek, but further down from that, you can see um, here, this is a larger, uh, higher order stream, and you can see the same effect. There's high turbidity because of the erosion and runoff on one side versus, uh, versus the other. So these were all in the past few years. Um, Again, the color on the screen is maybe not the best, but hopefully you can see this. These are images that NASA puts out. We generally think of NASA as you know, exploration of space, but they also provide data for Earth observations. And so these are uh, dust storm events. Uh, this one's originating in Nebraska through Kansas. Uh, this one here is in West Texas, blowing into Oklahoma. And then these are from originating in Colorado, blowing into uh, Kansas as well. So major dust storm events, again, these all happened, um, you know, these aren't dust bowl air storms, these are within, within the past few years. And then um, here's another few, so this is massive erosion on a range that we uh, profiled in some of our work in central Texas. 
Um, this thing is over 100 meters long and 10 meters deep in its deepest place. And, uh, and so where is that coming from? Well, this ranch is the only grassland left in that area. It's completely surrounded by cultivation and not even no-till or conservation till. It's all conventional moldboard filed uh, till. And then, of course, uh, these were from South Dakota, but uh, the same story has happened in Missouri and Western Iowa as well this year with uh, major flooding events that have happened uh, over the past few years. So major, major events that are tied to what we do on the landscape and how we manage the landscape. So that's some recent events that I think should captivate us, at least make us think a little bit deeper about the problems that we face, especially for addressing 21st century um, issues. So as a systems thinker, um, one of the premises, one of the um, uh, sort of ethics or ethos of the systems approach is that before jumping to a solution or, or coming up with a strategy or whatever you're going to do is, is stop for a moment, take a step back and ask why. Uh, so given the critical role of what soil has, I think those events, and in might have observed, you're seeing other cases, that are severe, or maybe more severe than those that I think are pretty alarming. So, human nature, the way that we're hardwired, I teach a decision making class, we don't have time to do it tonight, but there's a number of decision making things that we as human beings do that, that tempt us to just jump towards a solution or immediately go and try to solve uh, the problem. And uh, action is needed, but we need, I think, a systems approach that appreciates the underlying root causes of the problem before we go and attack it, unless we make potential problems even, even worse. And so my question in regards to those events um, that I just shared with you um, might read something like this. So despite our knowledge, management agility, and scientific advances, why do soil and water degradation events persist or are getting worse? That's my why question before jumping into handling you know, a flooding issue or an erosion issue. Take a minute and ask why and, and really think about the root causes. So in order to do that, um, this is one of the teaching things I teach you. I teach a number of classes, so some of that may come out tonight. Um, one of the principles in the systems approach, a concept that we use is called the iceberg diagram. The iceberg diagram is, uh, is meant to force us to think about is what are the underlying structures or root causes below the surface that aren't obvious to the eye at the surface. And the reason it's called the iceberg is because, um, as the saying goes, roughly 10% of the iceberg is visible above the surface. The majority of the iceberg's mass is below the surface. You can't see below the surface of the water. So, uh, the top of the iceberg is events, and that's what happened. And I've already shown you some of the events that would stick out in my mind as a person that cares about our natural resources. What are some of those events? And we already talked about some events. Um, a little bit deeper than that are trends, and that's what's been happening over time. And so maybe we can talk about it. We'll get some trends here in just a moment. Uh, that's what's been going on. And then lastly, the structure. That's the deepest part of the iceberg. And that's, if we get down to the structure, then we can actually identify why some of these things persist and behave the way that they do. Learning takes place. We can learn some things up here, but real learning takes place down here at the bottom of the iceberg where the structure is. Because that's where the relationships are, the mental models are, the, the forces and pressures that create uh, what we see on a landscape or in an organization. Uh, so systems thinking through this iceberg concept helps us identify what the structure may be. So we talked about some events. What are some trends and patterns? Um, again, this is a not, I don't think, the best light on the projector. So let me orient you to the graphs. This uh, x-axis here is over time. Uh, and this goes back to uh, the 1950s. And on the y-axis here is land and farm. Uh, or cultivation for the north central United States. Uh, I'll probably, just, I think this graph will come up again uh, later. And this just shows the trajectory of land use over time. Basically, since the 1950s, land and cultivation has gone up in the north central 
United States. The dotted line there is kind of the trend line. Uh, that's the raw data. Uh, here's another couple of graphs. Again, the, the x axis is over time. Uh, on one axis is the, uh, I can't even read that whole line, is the number of uh, farms and millions. And on the, uh, the other axis is the land uh, and cultivation. So cultivated land uh, per farm has gone up while the number of farms have gone down. So we see farms that are consolidated, gotten bigger, larger. Average farm sizes while the number of producers and farmers uh, have gone down. Um, this graph here, it doesn't go as far back, it only goes to 2010. Uh, and what it shows is US farm subsidy payments in billions. Uh, the total is kind of flat, but what's more interesting to me is the non disaster payments um, have become an increasing share of the total farm payments. So there's some policy things that we might pull out. Uh, and then down here, uh, this trend, so some economic data, again, over time, this goes back to 1960, and this is the uh, Iowa corn price. The black line is the raw data, the dotted line is the inflation adjusted data. Uh, so really haven't seen in long term some of the prices what they came in, in terms of what the dollar value is not so low. Uh, so that's some sort of economic land use data that we can think about. Again, I'm just giving you an example, big picture trends over, over time to get you to think about maybe what you would put in your own iceberg diagram. Here's uh, some additional resource data. Um, the lines here represent the amount of uh, acreage and ag that is irrigated. Uh, the line there that I care about is total. And so uh, irrigation is becoming, uh, uh, or has been uh, increasing over time. Uh, the next graph shows, again, about to 1960, um, the different uh, inputs to uh, the ag, our ag systems in the US. The bottom two lines there are phosphorus and potassium, so they're pretty flat over time. But the illustrative one is the nitrogen use, which, is, which grew significantly. And although it's flat, it's still slightly going up um, to uh, the, present, the present time. And then finally, uh, this is data. Um, I could shrink this up to uh, show it a little bit better, but I think you get the idea. This is David Montgomery's uh, uh, erosion data. So again, over time, and this is the soil loss or formation rate on the y-axis. All the black dots represent the erosion rates that we measured. Over time, while the little, I'm not sure if you can see these guys right down here, the little white boxes right next to the uh, x axis there are the, the measured soil formation rates at those different locations. So erosion rates way greater than the formation rates. So that, again, that's evidence in some of the pictures uh, that I showed uh, just a few moments ago. So those are some trends and patterns. So, what about structure? Again, I've sort of outlined big picture national scale, but it's just to get all of us to think about what some of these issues are, what's been changing over time to get to the structural forces that are at work. And so I know there's some students in the room that are looking for some credit, I think, so maybe I'll put this to the school um, or back to whoever would like to answer. But just really quickly, why do you think, what are some forces that have pushed land use the way it's been? Or, resource use, and what are some forces that come to mind? What are some pressures in resource use that come to mind? Any, any guesses here? Again, this is one teaching moment, so humor me here. So what are some forces and pressures that someone on the landscape that would contribute to some of those trends and patterns? Population, absolutely. The change in population, the demographic changes occur on the landscape. Anybody else? Well, I had my coffee. Maybe you should have more coffee. All right. Pretty good. Okay, so the uh, mindset of the farm and production. The mindset of the farmer in the production, absolutely. Federal crop insurance. Federal crop, so government policies like crop insurance. Government policy uh, capable or not capable of who must be cheap. 
consumer. Okay, so the policy of lowering, keeping food prices low for the consumer. Absolutely. Anybody else? That's a fair list to get started. Let me show you a, a comprehensive list of maybe farming practices, the mindset of the farmer, supply chain, the constraints, economic forces, maybe the policy fits in there with um, with government policies about support for farmers or what the price of food should be, available land and the land use dynamics at work, conservation programs and the funding for conservation programs, water scarcity, less of a problem here, I think, but that's my area areas west of here, water scarcity becomes more of a concern. Uh, ownership and lessee pressures, demographics, budget constraints, land and water laws, resistance to change, consumer demands, energy concerns. You know, prior to 2006 or seven, agriculture really wasn't that coupled to energy so much. After some changes in policy, now energy plays uh, a huge role. And then individual behavior. So those are some structural things that would propagate up and help create or reinforce those trends and patterns. So uh, a lot of these are social, economic, or policy. Uh, let me show you a few other pictures of the structure of the landscape and what these pressures and forces lead a landscape to look like that would reinforce uh, those events that I showed you just a minute ago. Uh, so some of those policies and economics, and demographic, family changes, et cetera, lead to landscapes that look like this. And uh, so this is a picture from Central South Dakota. Uh, I imagine there's probably a good, good a fair bit uh, amount of land in Iowa that looks like this in the wintertime as well. That's some snow, but there's basically no cover over that um, soil right there. Um, again, the, the light doesn't do these pictures a whole lot of, of, of justice there. What this shows is a, is a stream bank. This is a tributary to the Big Sioux River in eastern South Dakota. And what's illustrated here is there's basically no bank protection, and the little uh, dots that you see up there are livestock that are grazing basically right up to uh, right up to the bank there. And then here's a picture looking the other way. So basically, there's no buffer capacity on that particular stream uh, right there whatsoever. Um, and then here's a picture of if you pulled some of that soil out, what would that soil look like? Um, I'm holding that picture again. This is from the same area. And I, I told you how much that thing weighed. Again, it was only like right here in front of me, but that bulk of soil right there weighed probably like 40 pounds. It was completely, completely compacted. There's no available space in there whatsoever. It's basically a brick. Um, right there. So all those pressures and forces that create a landscape like this, well, then we might expect to see the events that we started with, but those runoff and erosion events um, that we've seen. Uh, so I've introduced a lot, and uh, it's not to be overwhelming, it's just to appreciate the complexity of these landscapes and the interacting forces between how we manage land, the policies, the economics, all the things that will interact to produce the behavior we see in a system. Uh, unfortunately, the way we're hardwired as human beings, again, I wish I had more time to go into this, but the way we're hardwired is we really aren't equipped to handle all that complexity. Uh, due to time constraints, uh, limited resources, uh, we simply can't know or investigate all the possible alternatives. Um, because even though collective information or collective knowledge may be unlimited, what we as a society learn and know, this thing right here that we carry around in our heads is still limited. It's a limited processing ability that we carry around. Um, and because of those things, it makes it difficult to find optimal um, solutions. And when we add all the dynamics and complexity that I've tried to introduce so far, um, it makes us really, really poor. Um, it leads to very poor inferences about what's going on. And so some research sort of that dives into this more. Um, the human being, the human mind, we're really only capable of processing three or four variables at a time. 
probably the most complex system that we as human beings can understand and navigate and process in real time is probably the transportation system. And driving an automobile and the rules of the road and all that things that we have to do to get around where we are. That's probably as complex as we uh, can get in real time. And so to cope with that complexity, we satisfy. So we just find whatever the satisfactory um, solution is, what the satisfactory outcome is at that time. We don't typically think about the process what a deeper uh, solution might be, we satisfy it until we, it leads to some suboptimal uh, solutions. So, um, again, all that's by way of introduction and hopefully helps us think about the complexity of what we have to deal with in terms of soil and water and conservation issues. Uh, so, where does the system approach come in? Right? Let me define the systems approach. Well, uh, the systems approach is grounded in this field called system dynamics. And there's really three tenets of what I think constitute a system dynamics or systems thinking approach. Um, it's, a, it's a holistic approach that recognizes um, and tries to diagnose the root um, causes of the problems that we deal with. It's also a suite of tools that we use, and I'll share some of those uh, here momentarily. Um, and for those that are participating, like Jackie mentioned in the workshop, we get into what some of those tools are that we can use to diagnose and get to the root cause uh, of these problems. And then lastly, it's a mental model. And I'll talk quite a bit more about mental models later, but it's a mental model that appreciates all that complexity that I tried to introduce uh, up until this point. Uh, and so we don't try to discard that. We try to appreciate and incorporate that as much as, as, much as we can into our own mental model uh, so we have a better understanding of the system as a whole. Uh, where did this come from? Many of you have probably heard of Ludwig von Bertalanffy, who is credited as the father of the general systems theory or the general systems approach. Um, in his seminal book, The General Systems Theory, in the late 1960s, he was trained as a biologist, and so most people um, associate him with science. But his work in the systems approach is the growth curves that he developed. And there's a growth curve named after him for his biology work. Um, J.W. Forrester would be next in line, and he's probably the most influential person I'll show on this slide. He was an engineer at MIT that developed a lot of the tools that we use in this approach. And uh, what I find really interesting about Dr. Forrester was that he credited growing up on a family ranch in Nebraska that facilitated his understanding of systems. Uh, he did a lot of work, so. And if you Google this stuff later, you'll probably find his name associated with a lot of it. And then more modern day folks who operate in this arena uh, is Peter Singay, the author of The Fifth Discipline. So a lot of what's covered there we do in the workshop in the next couple of days. Um, John Sturman, who's at MIT and Business Dynamics, has been a leader in sort of the quantitative approach. And I'll show you some of the quantitative uh, approaches here uh, coming up. And then finally, a good friend of mine, Mike Goodman, who I've known for years, wrote one of the first, um, first textbooks in this field for education study of system dynamics. So if you Google some contemporaries in this arena, those are some names you're probably likely to find. So how does this approach work in combining some of these quantitative approaches with a mental model um, appreciation of complexity that we see? So here's how um, this schematic I put together to illustrate the process we use to go through the approach. Um, so we recognize this, this is us as a scientist or the manager or the user, and um, our decisions change reality. Literally, we go out and make decisions that change the world. And whether it's a big change or a small change, but you know, I bought a Starbucks coffee and that changed the world for a moment because I was one more customer in line. And, and so all the decisions we make big change, small change, change the reality of what's going on. We then take what happens in reality and compare that to what we expected to happen. So when things go awry and the results in the real world don't meet our expectations, that's a trigger for us to think a little bit deeper about what's going on in this particular problem. So when they don't really meet the results of the real world, don't really fit our expectations, 
We use data from the real world and our new model of what we um, imagined or what we thought would happen to build out a model. And we use that model in an iterative process for learning about what the possible trajectories are, what the possible drivers are, what are some of the rules of the road to change, how would that change the outcome of the system. And then we use that learning in this iterative process to improve our own mental models and our, improve our own decision making about what's going on and communicate that um, to whoever the other decision makers in the real world might be. So I think that I think hopefully shows this iterative process of comparing our mental model to the real world and then using the model to learn about what the possibilities might be. All right, so that's the quick and dirty introduction to the systems uh, systems approach right there. Um, the next section, I'm going to talk about what Jackie uh, mentioned in her introduction with some of the, the work that we've done in this um, arena. And I'm not sure if I have enough because I didn't know what the turnout would be. Um, because as I get going through this, um, a lot of this is already published. And so uh, I'm going to get through as much as I can, as quickly as I can to get to the frontiers because I think where the real nuggets are is not in the stuff that's like published and it's still coming out, but I think in the frontiers uh, of where this is going. So I brought in advance uh, some handouts here that will cite everything that I'm going to show in the next 18 or so slides. So I, there's a, a bunch here, but I'm not sure. Um, Absolutely. All right, so there's a couple of application areas I'm going to, I'm going to show again. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because uh, the handout will go around that shows where all this is published. Um, but what got me started in this program um, and soil and water conservation using this approach started uh, with looking at grassland conversion in, uh, in the, the northern plains. And so uh, this is a picture from West River, South Dakota. It's dry land, not, ir not irrigated, 10 to 11 inch mean annual precipitation. And if you can't see the picture right there very well because of the light, this is basically a hillside and there is not a plant material. All that is completely bare ground, right? In an extremely arid environment that's relying, that's relying only on the precip for that production. So that poses some interesting. Uh, potential risk and interesting problems right there. So our why question was, why is land conversion accelerating despite what we know about the soil and environmental limitations in this region? So the region that we looked at was what we defined as the North Central U.S. Um, so Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, Colorado, Montana. Uh, we integrated both qualitative and quantitative sources. Um, I'll probably talk more in a minute about qualitative sources, but we use uh, as much quantitative data as we could in terms of economics and land use and uh, insurance rates and CRP rates and all these things that influence the land use. And then we use that model to test uh, what the, or anticipate what the soil environmental risk would be given that this area is already limited in its soil capabilities or climate and everything else. Now we're adding this other risk on top of it by breaking it out into cultivation. So, um, so here are some of the data sources that we used, and we tied this together. And uh, for those that are in conservation, might recognize the term land capability class. And so we modeled the land, the changes in each land capability class. Um, where most of the systems work gets into with modeling, mental models, and decision making. Uh, which is like policy, economics, and cultural factors. We attach to that this factor of the land capability class. So how favorable would we would the land be for cultivation or not? So depending on what their mental model decision would be, they would then make a decision on how the land would be distributed between crops and grasses. Um, so if that distribution changes, uh, what's their change in crop production? What's their expected? Uh, production look like, and how constraining is their land base given the capabilities of their particular 
soils and um, so how economically feasible is that that feeds back into their decision on how profitable they are I hope you can see that feedback loop right there that's the main uh, feedback loop uh, model and then we use the information about their distribution of crops and grasses with their inherent soil limitations in the capability class to model what the soil environmental risk is how risky is that decision to break out new ground on that particular place. All right, um, so that's kind of the framework. And then what do these models look like? Um, I don't think I'll go through this in too great detail, just to give you a flavor of what these models look like. So this is the, uh, this is the grain market that's a part of the model. So there's grain inventory that's a function of production and consumption, and that feeds back into the change in demand, what's been going to the price. And so that's a little grain market component. There's obviously in this part of the world where we were interested in, livestock is a huge uh, driver. And so there's a, a livestock component, so lean stock, breeding stock, uh, beef inventory that they're producing. And so there's some feedbacks here on breeding and retention at the lean. Uh, so there's a livestock inventory component. Uh, there's an aging chain component because somebody mentioned I think one of the students mentioned earlier demographics uh, or population change uh, in the area. So there's a human dimensions component for uh, the aging chain of the population and how people either move into or out of the landscape, depending on how favorable it is to come back to uh, their operation. And then lastly, what is really the core of this whole model is the capability class. And so that changes based on the farmland expansion or grass establishment and balancing that out. Uh, again, there's a lot of symbols and things in there. I'm much worried about you getting that. I just want to show you a flavor of uh, what some of this uh, looks like. And then here's the interface. And so uh, there's some things we can test in some of the decision factors. So how much do people value conservation or farming and, and their profitability and all these things. That we can test instantaneously to see what the potential outcome would be. And so here are some uh, trends that I'll get to here uh, now in total land and farming for the region and soil environmental uh, risk. So, how did the model, this particular model, perform? Uh, this is the graph I showed um, earlier in the trend section over time. Uh, the sawtooth line is the actual data. Of how land use has changed towards cultivation in the states. And then the dotted line underneath is what the model proposed would happen. And I just want to be really clear about what the model is saying is going to happen here with that dotted line. It's not a regression type model, uh, it's more like a physics model. So if you've ever been in it, with the engineers, I think the engineers in the room will appreciate it. It's more like a physics lab. You set the initial conditions, you, you let go of the system, and you see what happens. So the only thing in this model that I that we parameterized is 1947. And we set, you know, there's obviously a trajectory for grain demand, some other things that are forcing this system, but we set it up, whatever the initial conditions are, and, and then we let it run. And these are some major uh, events that have occurred over that over that time period. Uh, and then just to prove to you that this is a research talk, here are some stats. <laughs> All right. Uh, and so you don't have to know what those numbers are. Again, we published this, and that's why I gave you the handout. So if you're really a nerd like me and want to know more, you can find out exactly what I'm doing uh, this information. And so we looked at anticipating what the change would look like. And so here's the trajectory of the land use uh, in this area increasing through the 2020s. And then it's nice and level off. Um, what about soil environmental risk? This whole thing was about anticipating what the soil environmental risk would be. Here's the historical, and uh, just to, to give you a flavor of what this y axis is and soil environmental risk, uh, what that is is the riskiness. Again, it's based on that land capability class, and so it's basically a fraction of how much of that land is left is conserved versus. How much of, of it's been broken out? So it can be 100, 200, it depends on what that ratio uh, is. But here's the historic number uh, over that calibration time period. Um, 
The decimal error estimates, we didn't get that far because we didn't have the data to sort of set up the model to see what happened during that 1930s period, but I kind of did some backtracking to figure out what that range might look like. And in the Dust Bowl era, it was pro it's probably somewhere up in this area right here. Um, so what did the model do? Uh, and before I show you the, the trajectory of what happened, uh, again, I don't have time to talk about the scenario planning that went into how we tested it, but you might see right down here, these are the different scenarios. And this is um, crop insurance premium subsidies, uh, a cultural scenario like reinvigorated youth, so a youth that is afforded to come back into agriculture and add operation or add enterprises to, uh, to an operation. There's some economic things like land cost, um, livestock integration, which is one of the cultural ones, and then some other policy ones here like um, CRP elimination. Probably not going to happen, but given the budgets that states are under on what they can enroll in CRP. And you know, if you can imagine with the government, you know, all the crazy stuff that we see, that hopefully doesn't happen, but it's something we might imagine. And then some positive ones like doubling down on conservation compliance. So what the conservation compliance goals are for a land that can and can't be sort of broken out. So um, we won't go through all of them, but here's the trajectory of the scenarios, the base case without anything goes up to a four point something before it levels off. Uh, some of the ones that we anticipated would improve or reduce the risk of some of these events, uh, like the conservation compliance or some of the cultural ones, uh, they kind of balance out, but it takes some time to see. Uh, so the short-term and long-term dynamics, you know, you gotta play this thing out over a long period of time to see it, what happens. So some of these come back and then some of these that improve or enhance the, the likelihood of land coming out, like CRP would go away or crop insurance, uh, premium subsidies will be enhanced, uh, then the risk you know, goes up some uh, right there. So, so that's what we did. And then, so the question, the, the thing to have to be why is that you know, riskiness going up you know, so much given that the land use that I showed you just a minute ago, you know, only changes like that. Right? And it has to do with the riskiness of that land as it's broken out. And so if you're familiar with land capability classes, there's eight classes of soils that are rated. And uh, here's how they look. So, um, and this is the percentage of that class. So class one is the best class of land that's best suited for farming. And when we started our projection, already, 90% of the class one land was already open. So there's no more class one land really that you can break out anymore. Right? Um, there's a little bit of land that can be broken out in class two, that's the next best soil. Um, class three would be the next best. Uh, and in our projection, it doesn't reach kind of its limit. And these limits are kind of what the maximum USDA record has ever been for cultivation in that particular class. Um, and so the rest of the classes are down here, four, five, six, seven, eight. And so the story is, the lesson is a very small change in those classes of four, five, six, seven, and eight lead to very dramatic changes in the riskiness of the events that we showed just a few minutes ago. Right? So that's the lesson from uh, that particular model. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll skip over that. It's in uh, some of the publications. So the next one, that's sort of the landscape approach. If we drill down a little bit lower, because I just sort of shared with you sort of the probability or the riskiness at the landscape level. If we drill down to the watershed level, what would it look like? So um, uh, a student that followed me here, I'm reporting some of what uh, they did. So uh, we asked if these projected land use trends and their risks are accurate, how will they manifest themselves? And so he modeled, uh, several catchments in South Dakota, Big Sioux, James, Matt, and Del Huge. Um, and so here's some of the things that he did. He drilled down to a, a HUC 10 level, that's hydrologic unit code 10, which is a, um, a classification like soils are classified in the class one, two, three, four. Um, this is a spatial scale on how um, coarse or fine the resolution is. Watershed. So um, again, the, the 
quality of the bulb here may not be great, but this is a very um, high resolution. Hub 10 is very high resolution. So I'm not sure of the kilometer scale or whatever. But it's, but it's high resolution compared to the landscape approach we were talking about before. And so using the model that I just told you about, now we overlay the watershed characteristics and he modeled erosion, uh, the hydrologic discharge, and some water quality issues, total system of solids. And so some of the things that he found, um, that CRP reductions, similar to what we showed, created uh, some really negative things. Um, tillage, I'll come back to tillage maybe in a moment, uh, with a huge leverage point and uh, results of the model. And if I show you some of those trends, um, one of the things similar to land capability classes, which I hopefully did a fair enough job illustrating just a minute ago, um, here's a couple of his projections that I'm only showing you here the annual erosion uh, rates for two of the watersheds. So this one is Belfuge. Uh, this is out in West River, South Dakota. It's the most arid, it's the most hilly, it's got the shallowest soils in the southwest versus the Big Sioux. Uh, which is Eastern South Dakota, Western Iowa, right? That sort of landscape. Um, so one of the lessons was the further west one moves, the more severe the outcomes were expected to be. Um, and so if you, what, what, how do we determine that? What we look at is, uh, if you see the trend line, these are all those scenarios I've shared before. And we look at, you know, how dispersed are those trends over time uh, in each peak of the watershed. Well, in the Big Sioux, there is some dispersion amongst the trends, but it's much less variable on a, on a percentage basis than the Gulf Sioux. So again, those small changes on the riskier soil lead to a larger outcome on the landscape. So he did, again, I'm just showing you erosion, but he did some of the others as well. And he found some counterintuitive things in the Big Sioux, which, uh, I don't think we have time tonight to talk about uh, tile drainage, but if there's any tile drainage people here, um, we can discuss, because I think there's some counterintuitive things that maybe are a part of that. Some good, some bad, right? I'm not taking this way, um, but I think that that's a conversation that would be interesting to hear about. All right, uh, a couple others really quick. Drilling down even more. So we started with landscape, down the watershed, now at the field scale. How about scale. Um, and so I asked the question, when land is switched between cropland and grassland, uh, how long does the soil resource retain the influence or legacy from the previous land use? And so we used this approach here. Uh, we did this at a number of locations in Central South Dakota. Um, again, sort of the framework for this is I've kind of buried the lead in all of this because all of this was stakeholder driven working with farmers and ranchers. That's all coming back to in just a minute. Uh, so we had this great management data from our interviews. And so I went back and I said, let me identify the one to really think about these issues and really understand what's happening in all their land. So I went back to those, um, those producers and they helped me identify some places on their land that would be a novel laboratory for this question. This soil energy. Oh, a soil interview, which basically sample the soil, but uh, to just suppose it to the management interview, we call it a soil interview. Um, and so we sampled some indicator data, compared that to its ecosystem reference, the reference data that we have for these particular ecosystems, look at how well these sites perform relative to their references, we collected some other soil information and used that to triangulate what we call the soil legacy. How long does that soil retain that time delay between when it's switched to when the performance is now reflective of the use that it's currently in? All right. So we call that the legacy effect. So here are some pictures of the indicators. Again, there's 17 of them. So that will take a whole lecture and stuff to go through all 17 of the uh, indicators. But these are some pictures of what they look like. We look at things like uh, rill and water flow patterns. We look at compaction and things happening in the soil. Aggregate stability is one of the rankings. Uh, soil cover, soil movement. Uh, there's some uh, biotic integrity things in there. We look at plant community, looks like, right? So a number of indicators. 
there that sort of group into soil site stability, uh, hydrologic function, and biotic integrity. Uh, and so there are 17 of them in indicators of cross pet those functions. And so what did we find? Uh, there's a little bit about the uh, procedure we use after doing those 17 indicators. Uh, the results were this, the greater the grassland presence in the cultivated site's history, the closer it was to its wetland condition. So that kind of maybe fit in some of our assumptions. Um, but here's the, the, what I was interested in, the grassland indicator scores were significantly farther from ecosystem reference up to 20 years post cultivation. So you remember that brick I showed you a minute ago, right? That brick was from a site that was just put back in the grass one year before. So 20 years before that brick turns into or is retransformed back into the grassland soil that's high aggregate stability, high organic matter, high infiltration, those things that are associated with a uh, good grassland uh, soil. And then another interesting thing was that the cultivated sites with grazing livestock uh, showed no significant differences from the traditionally cultivated ones. So the riskiness of adding the livestock back in to those indicators wasn't present. So that goes well for some of the enterprises in terms of reintegrating livestock back into the system. And then again, I sort of buried the lead on all this. So now from data to decision making, this is uh, my friend Jay Fior. Many of you probably know Jay. So I've worked with Jay, he's a conservationist in uh, North Dakota, so he helped us do some uh, soil health workshops. And so, given the data about what we know about the riskiness of these soils, uh, the outcomes that we see on the landscape from the decisions that are being made, why don't we see greater success rates in the adoption of diverse conservation practices? So, um, so we try to figure that out. We try to at least dive into the mental models about why change on the landscape changed the way that, that it has. So here's a map of Dakota, uh, South Dakota, and these are the markers. Marks uh, one of our stakeholders who was in the process. Farmers, ranchers were influencers. I think the farmer and rancher is pretty self-explanatory, but the influencer uh, category, these were uh, conservation professionals. These were uh, local CPAs, they were ag commissioners, they were researchers, any number of different people that work with folks on the land. And you can see some of the profile of, of enterprises and things that were um, included. So here's what we found out about their particular mental models and motivations on the landscape. Um, you can see here farming, very efficiency oriented, enterprise accountants. Interested in this, minimize externalities, but there's a, I'll come back to the caveat for that in just a minute. Uh, so minimize externalities, ranching, synergy oriented, whole farm accounts, looking for your whole ranch, tended to try to avoid externalities. And the influencer over there, um, trying to take a very sympathetic approach to either side, value, value each side. Where did they stand in common? These are some of the differences. Uh, what was in common? Everyone wanted to expand their operation, so that's that pressure on the land. If they're all trying to expand, there's only a finite amount of land to do it. Everyone concerned with the transition to the next generation and what that means for their local communities. And so here's the caveat, here's the lead that I buried up until this point. Um, in the spirit of Aldo Leopold and the land ethic concept that he developed, what was the land ethic that we described? The land ethic of the farming community, they viewed their land ethic, the voices that emerged out of all these interviews and workshops, was that their land ethic, I'm a good land manager, good producer, if I'm maintaining my productivity. And that's much different than the rancher mental model of their land ethic, maintenance of ecosystem integrity that the ranchers that we work with. So, they have a land of the concept of the nuance of what how they define how they filter that concept into their decisions on the land is drastically different. And so where do the stakeholders fit in? Well, they are reluctant to push one group or the other, one way or the other, because they're a stakeholder in their community. 
So if they're a farmer or ranger in my community, why would I disrupt them if they're still here? Right? So those are some differences some nuances there. So again, I flew through that I think fairly quickly, but hopefully that gives you a flavor from landscape, watershed, field scale, and then to the personal scale, the differences in people and how they emerge. So finally to the frontiers, um, where I see some of this work going and what I think would be. The last slide you showed, could you go back to it? It's the yellow that is going to be where you can leverage the most change in the community, right? Right. I'm not sure if everyone heard Jackie's comment, but the, the comment was the yellow line, the, the highlighted part here, is where there's very high leverage. Yes. Yeah, so if you change, if you can influence somebody in epic on how they view a particular uh, or how they view ecosystem goods and services or some conservation benefits they receive. That's I love that, that's the mental model leverage. That is, as you it's said, be very hard. also very hard. Yes, right. highest leverage, but also not um, not very easy. All right, um, I'm probably pretty long for time, so uh, quickly here some frontiers um, for the soil health movement, because a lot of us uh, are probably involved in the soil health movement in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and I and I kind of intro the talk earlier with the 21st century challenge. Um, here's the 21st century challenge as I understand it, and if you understand it differently, then, then help me improve my mental model about it. But here's how I understand it: is to produce and supply more food and fiber with less land, water, energy, and environmental impact. Given the demands of society, consumers, population growth, pace of growth, all those things, we got to produce. And supply more, but less of all the other things and less impact. Right? So, soil health, consider that because soil health is that ability of the soil to deliver those eco ecosystem goods and services that we hopefully all care about. The principles of that, many of you probably recognize these minimal disturbance, permanent ground cover, maintain living roots, integrate lifestyle. And how has this changed over time? This comes from, again, my friend Jay Pure in North Dakota. Um, this has really only emerged in the past 15 years or so, the soil health movement. Prior to that, it was about a particular practice with like conservation tillage. So it was only about a symptom. What's the tillage? The soil health movement is more root cause, I think, in a good way, more root cause because it's more holistic on what is the whole soil. Um, what is the whole soil body uh, doing? All right, so where has the soil health movement been? Uh, there's been exponential growth in the interest and knowledge in soil processes and soil health. And uh, if you're not aware of this, it actually started over 100 years ago. Um, it started out as an agronomy experiment, experiment, but it's really about soil health. And that's the old rotation at Auburn University uh, started in 1890 something, still there on campus in Auburn today, and there's a number of trials that they do uh, repeated year after year, or so, 100 year on something they just did. Um, so it goes back as far as far as then. Um, and then this trend over time, again, the light probably can't see very well. Um, the y axis here are Google Scholar hits on um, soil health. Anybody can go pull this up on Google Scholar. I did it like Seven minutes, right? Um, our Google Scholar hits on soil health, and and this is biased, all right? I'm not saying this is totally objective, you know, because the proliferation of journals and you know, keyword and all that stuff that gets pulled down. So it's not completely objective, but I mean, there's been growth in interest and you know, indexing towards things about soil health, right? So that's all good. Um, unfortunately, there's a significant lag. And the production practices that are what we see and reflected to what we know about the soil. So um, this is some ag census stuff. Uh, and at first it looks it looks okay. This is on one axis is the percentage, and I grouped them into no-till and reduced till, so both, right? Uh, no-till and reduced till, about 19 to 20 percent of farms uh, this is from the census. Um, so going back almost 10 years now, about 20 percent. And then there's the acreage. So the acreage in, in no till or reduced till uh, has gone up. So you can call that 
probably not a bad thing, right? But it kind of gets back to what Jay mentioned or what I had quoted from Jay on the previous slide where we started at conservation till, we moved to no till, now we're trying to move towards soil health. Uh, but that message really hasn't filtered through yet because when we look at the cover crop, so that cover crop that provides living roots, soil cover, you know, three of the four you know, tenets of the soil health you know, paradigm uh, is meant by that cover crop. The number of farms implementing that or, or having cover crops, okay, that's grown here going back to 2007 from 16 up to over 18 percent that are using cover crops. Unfortunately, acres for whatever reason has declined. And so this is going from 30 some odd million acres, 38, so reduction of over 2 million acres in cover crops. So hopefully now after being versus this statistics thinking, you might be asking yourself, I mean, why is that the case? Why do we see this discrepancy there? Yeah, so maybe we can talk about that later. So the two frontiers that I see, and these are not the only frontiers, there's likely five or six or 10 frontiers, but the two that, that I feel that I can talk about and contribute to are the role of models, kind of like what I showed you before, and conceptualizing, quantifying, and communicating these soil health concerns, and then dynamic decision-making that leads to actually transferring that to the producers on the landscape to try to create um, a better looking uh, landscape. So really quickly, um, where does soil health fit into that from a modeling perspective? Well, as a modeler, I view, you know, if we're gonna produce more with less and less environmental impact, well, this is just a schematic uh, supply chain. So there's a supply chain commodity stocks, processing, food distribution, consumption, uh, et cetera. And so that supply chain produces some environmental impact. A lot of that we can't control. I mean, if we're not in that world, because each one of these stages creates its own externalities. It's probably not something that I'm interested in. Maybe, maybe you are not particularly what I'm tuned to. Um, and how those, just that 21st century challenge loop, that that consumer influences what we do on the landscape. So that's the feedback loop right there. Um, and so where does soil help it in? Well, part of that environmental impact is what happens through the food production and the supply chain and how disruptive and infinite intense we are through the system. And that's what the landscape contributes to the environmental impact uh, from how we manage the 21st century challenge. And as indicated, and in, like, for example, the soil legacy stuff that I just mentioned, depending on how strong this guy is influences the capability of that land to function. So there's another feedback loop in there as well. And soil health, I think, fits right in the middle of that particular uh, feedback loop. So investments in soil health and production practices are important, I think, fit in two areas. And that's one, uh, the productivity of that landscape, but also the ability to mitigate and reduce that disturbance and input intensity that leads to those outcomes. My guess is that 95, 98, whatever folks working in this area are working in uh, this area right here, soil health. So link soil health indicators and processes there. Um, and so as I thought about this and talked to other people about it, um, a professor of soil science at, within the A&M system told me once, um, I was showing them some stuff that we're working on, so I'm not sure we'll ever have a model of soil health. And I said, okay, I mean, that's one opinion. Uh, but it's an expert opinion. I value that opinion. But I think why that person said that is because typically we think of soils in one of these three columns. Physical soil, chemical soil, bi biological soil processes. Um, and only later do we start to make the link after we sort of develop and quantify what's in that particular, particular box um, and what outcomes come from that. So I think systems models help bridge that gap by moving from a soil health model that looks like that to a soil health model that looks like this, interactions between the biological and chemical 
and physical. And I have a grad student, it's in the appendix of the slide, if you go look at the grad student right now, just help me and we kind of have these pieces put together and then the next stage we'll be adding this guy and uh, we have some interesting results about, uh, about that. Um, and then lastly, which I think is, again, I think 95, 98% of the people in total health are working on that other stuff. But I think the highest, the highest leverage stuff is actually in the decision. And I'll, I'll share with you this example. Um, here, um, these are some key terms about some decision making things. Um, I just want to share this quote with you here, here at the bottom though. Uh, John Sturman was one of the uh, systems folks I showed you in the foundations section. And this is one of the things he advises in his teaching and research as a systems person, is that if you exclude a variable, variable from your model that you know exists in the real world, you're basically assuming that value is zero. And that's the only value that we know is not true. All right. So how does this look um, in actually modeling these things? So here's an example taken from an inter interview excerpt from a producer. It says, as a manager, I'm responsible for maximizing crop returns and directing our land use and production, uh, making marketing decisions about our inventory storage, we try to sell in order to meet our market's demands or adjust our land use accordingly based on our inventory surplus or shortage to balance production or net returns because if it's more profitable, we want to put more land uh, or develop more resources to it. Due to the high fixed costs and risk involved, though, any land we retire, we replace by picking up new multiple acres elsewhere on our place or somewhere nearby. So if we actually model that out, here's what uh, some of the feedback loops would look like and land and cultivation, part driven by inventory and how profitable they are. Uh, and then what the market is signaling them to do and in terms of the inventories, uh, surplus or shortage, and that sort of drives their main decision making. Well, we model this out, and this is one of the cases that we teach. Um, if we think about it over the long term, this is a 50 year time period, and here's 500 acres of this particular farm. Right, that's the baseline 500 acres. That's if we don't use any dynamic decision making to change anything about the way you use it, just cultivate 500 acres. Well, now if we incorporate that decision rule that the producer just gave us, what do you think the trajectory of the way you use would look like? Maybe it will change in some way, right? Well, here's what happens it actually changes when we make a market change halfway through the run. We get an increase in land use from 500 up to 1,000. But what's important about that trend is that it goes up, but it doesn't come down. Because part of that decision rule was, you know, we respond to all these forces, but the land that we retire, we try to pick up elsewhere. So if that's part of your decision making mental model, it makes it really hard to reduce land use. So it's not immediately obvious that the manager fails to reduce their cultivated acres, even though it might mean an increase in the profitability. Right? So my thinking is there's probably some well-entrenched farm management practices embedded in decision rules like that that we've got to identify. And I think that is more interesting or more higher leverage or frontier. Not to say that the goal called science stuff is important, but that's what it is. But to get people to think about how to change that decision, we got to know what the decision rules are. And I don't think we have a very good understanding of what the decision rules are um, right now. Um, so, in terms of the science, we've got a lot invested now in soil health programs. And as I've shown with the data right now, the science is outpacing what's happening in the real world. But this one area, one of the areas where science is the leading rather than lagging indicator, which I think is good. But one of the things about systems is think about some of these underlying relationships, and one of the relationships is called limits to growth. And so I think we also need to prepare for the limits before they're gone, because if all it takes is budget change at the state or federal level, or some change in you know an election and what the agencies start doing. 
and that money can go away like that. So how are we building coalitions or efforts that prepare for the limits before they get here? Because we don't want to end up with a situation where our you know momentum stalls and it goes the other way. At least we can get it to a feasible level, but certainly again, my assumption is we're trying to improve these kind of things and prepare for the limits before they arise. Uh, so finally, in conclusion, because I'm probably way over, uh, but hopefully, hopefully it's been beneficial. Um, throughout this process, I surveyed the people on our team involved to see what they were getting out of the process. And so here's a couple of uh, quotes from there. I don't believe my prior perspectives would have been changed had it not been for my participation in this group. And forcing ourselves to sit down and think about what the underlying relationships and drivers were. Here's another one. Uh, I believe this group shared a delight in discovery with surprises emerged that greatly enhanced the understanding of the systems and relationships within them. There was a great intellectual reward in that discovery. So just some, just some reflections and value of the process. Um, and then as a basketball fan, a coach, uh, Coach K fan. All that you achieve in life, you never achieve alone. So certainly this is a team effort. So who's been on our team? Uh, conservationists, I mentioned Jay Pure, but a number, uh, a number of other conservationists have been involved. Uh, the student support, Jackie mentioned some of the student support that we see uh, throughout this effort. Um, industry folks, I mentioned Mike Goodman earlier, Corey Peck uh, is another one in the systems education uh, and consulting world that was a part of our work. Uh, the landowners and producers that supported us and allowed us to interview them and their landscapes, uh, critical uh, faculty, staff, and students. Uh, don't have to go through all these, but a number of, their, of those. Uh, but certainly for me, the two most important ones, my coach Case, uh, have been uh, Barry Dunn and Roger Gates, who were the ones that started this whole program that, that we've been we've been doing. So what can what can we do to improve conservation? So we do a lot of research, a lot of different ideas. Uh, expand our mental model about the causes and effects of the landscape. I try to communicate that. Hopefully, you got a flavor for what I mean by mental models and how we process things. Um, so maybe take a step back the next time we see one of those discrepancies and think about why that is. And maybe we can change our mental model and improve it. And leverage often comes from new ways of thinking, new ways of interpreting, viewing, understanding, processing. The world around us. What we try to do is take a long term ecological approach on understanding some of these systems and, and how we use models to do that. And what I hope came through in some of the modeling and the frontiers is to address that complexity through integration rather than reduction. So that's kind of the premise of the system approach. And I think that wraps back to what I wanted to share. So at this time, I'll entertain any comments, questions, whatever you want to discuss. Any comments or questions online? So then I have a question for you. Yeah, sure. So it seemed like um, you did all the the science work where you were just getting to what's actually happening in the land, on the land, right? And then you went and talked to the farmers to see what they were doing management wise. Is that how that worked, or did you do talk to the farmers first and then go do all the work? Right. So that's why I said I buried the lead because we started with talking to the producers and then we did some modeling work and then I went to talk to them again. And then did the field work, and then we shared with them. When did it occur to you that their management decisions were some of the barriers? Like when did that? When did you start to go? Oh, their mental model, like about land ethics, that's that's a deep one inside of you. Right. So a little bit about the procedure. If you didn't hear the question, the question was when did it occur to us that that mental model or land ethic of the decision was really important? And so of all the stakeholder stuff. Um, that uh, I share with you on the interviews and stuff. 
Um, so I recorded all those and transcribed all those and coded all those. So I think from the interviews and the workshops that we did, I had like, I don't know, 300 something pages of transcripts. And I coded all those. And part of the coding procedure um, that we used helps identify those things. So it was literally built into the process to identify. It's a stakeholder analysis method, but it's built in to pick up on those differences. One different. One here, no one Look at how people are doing population and um, your model had a really good fit to the historical data. And kind of what I read into that is you're suggesting like soil based program, uh, CRP, RFS had very little impact on cultivated acres. But there's something more internal to the system that's driving cropland, um, the number of acres. I'm wondering if that's what you wanted to interpret, like the way you wanted me to interpret that. Right. And, and if so, what is the driver and internal dynamics of the system that's causing that pattern to emerge? Right. So that's an excellent question. For those who might not have heard the question, the question is, am I interpreting that when you show the land use of what we observed with the model predicted so well, what am I, am I interpreting that right that those Policy things that I showed on the graph really weren't that influential. What other things underneath the model or other factors we can we can see? So are you interpreting that right? That's an excellent question. So if you I'm not sure if it's, um, but if you look at when those programs were implemented, there is an effect, and as you see it in the short term, soil bank comes, acres go down, CLP comes, acres go down, renewable fuels, acres go up. And there's some there's some noise and adjustment. Period. So those are policy switches that, depending on when those policy events happen, they turn on and off. Right. So the other things underneath there that don't turn on or off are the age of the producer, the average size of the farm, the grain demand of the market, how much land is in class one, class two, class three. Those are structural for policy things that. Pick up on and say, well, those really don't have, yes, they really don't have that much of an effect. Well, they do, you know, you see some shifts in the short term, you know, shifts in the short term, uh, but the long term trajectory is, you know, looks like it's doing its own thing. And it is doing its own thing in a way because you've got farm size going up, you've got the grain demand going up, you've got average farmers, you've got Age is going up, so there's less livestock in the system because we're liquidating herds. All those other factors are baked in underneath that's contributing more to that trend than just the individual. Does that help you? I, I guess one of my questions is that, you know, did, did those policy factors really influence the way that you interpreted the model? Or is the model just something separate? Oh, yes. Yeah. So there's, there's variables for these policies. So when soil bank comes on in 19, you know, 56 right there, there's a time in the model where it hits 1956. Okay, there's a soil bank program that takes paper acres to come out. And that will run for X amount of years, then it turns off when the program is fired. When CRP comes, and so yes, those things are exposed in, in the model. Okay, so I'm gonna admit that I'm an agronomist, but I'm so proud of that. And I think that and um, I can understand collecting data and the qualification or the quantification stuff, but I want to talk about the qualification stuff and the mental model. All right, how do you know that the farmers that you interviewed or the ranchers that you interviewed are really representative of all ranchers and farmers? Because are you biased in who is willing to sign on and to talk with you? Right. So we are biased in our data set when who we'll talk to us. Uh, and we're biased in a good way because we talk to the conservation workers. We didn't, the people that aren't in our sample are the non the average. Those are the real people. Right. So I don't, I understand the limitation of what you're getting at. Uh, 
So I guess as I think about it, how would that change my if the result if the sample were larger and had others in it, how would it change? Maybe some terminology, some other things, but something else would come up that we don't capture here. Because the conservation award winners do care about conservation tillage, present habitat, other things, but what rises to the top for them was the maintenance of the productivity. So maybe some of those other things are even lower from the one so I understand what you're saying. I think that we're biased in one way to try to capture what, what the awards are. So, so, as some of you does work on the social side of things, when you put that up that farmers' land ethic is to right. maintain production, it resonated very strongly with me. And I've interviewed hundreds of farmers in Iowa, and not all the good players, but what that's telling me. Even the really good conservation right. farmers, their priority, their land ethic is to produce. Right. And that's at odds at times with some of the things that we are asking them to do now, which is to not produce in order to have well, a better ecological liberty. Maybe, maybe not produce, maybe it's just the way in which they go about it. But we're asking them to produce sometimes less acres to put some land. Right. Take it out of production. I mean, there's all sorts of things that we are going to be asking them to do, but unless we understand this model, it's just like they don't want to go to no till because no till asks them to not do anything as opposed to strip till or limited tillage, they still get to till. So right. the mental, it's that production mental model, whereas no till is actually doesn't feel like production as much. Right. Until we change the income to something that value their population. That's their livelihood. What their livelihood is 100 acres and you're asking them to take out 80 and don't compensate for that. But they do compensate for it when they ask them to do it in any kind of government program. But the, but the one you showed was that they could, uh, they might be able to farm less land with greater profit. Right. And that some of them still don't do, and they still don't do that. I, I still don't know why I, I missed your follow-up. I think that. we need to be careful that we, we recognize this is people's livelihood. I think we recognize that. No, no, I understand. But I'm just saying they think we value that and recognize that. But we can actually show them models where they're losing money in certain spots they're farming because they're <laughs> pothole areas for various reasons, and it still doesn't get them to change their behavior. So that's a great why question. Why, despite showing them data to the contrary, right. that it'd be more profitable not to farm the area, they'll still get a farm in that area. And that, so, I don't know the answer to that, but that would be a great why question. Right, well, the, the mental model thing is a two-way street. There's a certain way that we view the producer, but there's a certain way the producers also view uh, us as consultants. So. That's, I think, the point you're making. That's a two way street. And are we as clear and communicated about what we're after and how does that support them or not? And how is that perceived? Because oftentimes the perception outweighs the real need of what's there. It's really the perception. Thank you. I was a little interested to see that you start out with the whole idea of the system and then follow up with the various. Is and the decision making part here. And I think it's on the handout that you got. One of the citations um, in the decision making thing was, uh, uh, gosh, now I'm going to forget his name, um, uh, Thaler, who's, uh, uh, no, I think it's Nudge, the book Nudge on that reference sheet. Um, so he's a behavioral economist. And so he works with large you know, Fortune 500 companies. 
you know, Federal Reserve Bank, large organizations. And so in his work in behavioral economics, uh, the reason they call it nudge is because they go in and they look for what small little incentive or change the, the switch, you know, on to off, you know, from reverse the polarity meter or something, what little thing that we can change that would that creates the response by a decision maker uh, to nudge them in the direction that we want them to go um, with, you know, without overtly, you know, hammering them over the head. It's called a nudge. And I think that's where the frontier is. And uh, that's where probably I need to be more equipped with what are all the rules and regulation, all the things that the extension and conservation folks are out there doing. And, and what are those little nudges that can happen? That's where the, so if we identify what the decision rules are, so on one side we write down the decision rules, on the other side we line up what are you know, all the policies and programs and data and all the things that we can offer. If we just tweak the terms of one of those agreements or something else in there that doesn't jeopardize how they view you know, on their perception of what we're trying to get them to do, or their livelihood, or whatever, that produces a behavior that's more favorable. And a couple of examples that Taylor uses is like organ donation. So the default, you know, box when you go to the DMV, you know, it depends on uh, the adoption rate is not really what people think about um, organ donation. It's more driven by the default. Is the default uh, check here if you want to be an organ donor, or check here if you don't want your organs donated. And people don't even think about it, they just fill it out. And what the, the difference, the outcome is really significant. Now, I scratch my head about what that means for what are the nudges on the landscape, but uh, as an optimist, I think there's some nudges somewhere that we can take. I just I need to probably need your help also. On the cover crop slide, when you talk about how we have actually fewer acres of cover crop, did you look at availability of cost share and then also the drop in, in the grain market? Like, so did, when you were looking at it, did you look to see what like what the other trends were? Right, so one of the trends was the uh, uh, inflation adjusted price, which continues to go down. Uh, so that would be one. The one that I didn't pull up was the cost share thing. I just, cost share. Yeah, I just went to uh, maybe that's in the sense. I just went to the census and pulled up what the you know what they're reporting. I didn't go right. Yeah, so I think that's the I'm not sure if there's any comments on there any other questions. Well, I appreciate your time and attention, and hopefully this will come with our information. Were you in the room when you mentioned uh, drainage, Matt? Yeah. You're going to be talking about drainage. He's a drainage. Oh.